Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful uh, for me to get the opportunity to come here and take part in this workshop. And it's it's one of the finest physics building in a nice setting I have I have ever been to. Uh, it's it's great to see that this facility is is, is here and it's growing. Uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, this talk is organized in a somewhat more technical way, and um, what I will try to address is, uh, even though I did not put superconductivity, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be about topological magnets and a little bit about superconductivity, which is the reason I did not put it in the title. Uh, but it turns out that superconductivity, uh, Cooper pairing in this type of magnets could be extremely fascinating new direction. Okay, so let me start out thanking my students and collaborators. Much of what I will be talking about, uh, it's experimental work by Ilya, Guang, Gochin, Suyang, Sonia, Yashin. Some of them have now left my group. Uh, and the samples are from Amon Shankar, Feng Feng Chou, uh, Shuang Jia, primarily, and also from Mitun Shamart. Uh, some samples are from Wenhong Wang. And some of the uh, theory, first principle work I will show, it's mostly the work of uh, Go Ching Chan in collaboration with a number of uh, groups uh, we uh, collaborate with. And some of the works are carried out at uh, facilities where uh, we have been uh, part of building the beam line. Yesterday I mentioned the one of the most fascinating thing about topological materials that did not exist with the quantum hull, at least from an experimental point of view, is the possibility that we can operate at room temperature and we can manipulate and, and look at these uh, topological states. So this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite exciting because if you want to think of uh, some future application for topological materials, you have to be operating at room temperature. And, and this is uh, this is uh, allowed by uh, by these new topological states of matter. And again, yesterday I sort of went over some of the basic uh, fundamental characters of the topological materials. So uh, today's talk, I will focus more on uh, uh, having known uh, what is a topological insulator. What other things can we do? Uh, and I touch uh, touch a bit on balsamic metals, but uh, today I'll present them from a different angle and also uh, on, a, on um, uh, some results on different materials uh, uh, of similar physics uh, uh, and what other things we can do. Uh, all these things are in some way uh, connected. Okay. So uh, what I will do, I will, for each topic I listed, I will first state the challenge. What is the experimental challenge? And mention the theoretical uh, thing we are after. Uh, uh, and then I will uh, sort of give some details as relevant uh, how to realize those things, how we overcome those experimental challenge to realize what, what, uh, what we are after and then I'll mention a few things, what is the future like? So uh, I had two options. One is to take just one topic and go over in great experimental details. Uh, that's typically I would do in a seminar, but since it's a workshop with a broad audience and many theorists, I decided to pick three topics and give some experimental details, some result, and where the future of the field uh, to give you a sense, especially for theorists, a few years down the line in that sub -top, sub topic or sub field what it is that we'll be doing in experiments so that way theorists can sort of think along that line and perhaps guide experiment or think of uh, uh, some new ideas along that line so this is one of the first topics so here as I said that so far in the 3d topological materials what we were doing 
who are searching in the ICSD database. The chemists and material scientists, they have put together, uh, put up all these databases where you can find all these materials. There are like more than half, uh, or close to half million uh, uh, chemical compounds that are there. Now, so far, finding logical materials was about going into the database and trying to find what fits your bill, what, is, uh, what you're interested in, and then uh, fluctuate around that to find something interesting uh, that, that, uh, uh, that gives you, that realizes uh, something that's more closer to the theoretical model. So that was the operating mode for experimentalists. But uh, you, uh, as you know, the topological classification is, is based on symmetry and topology and uh, all the uh, fundamental properties uh, that are out there. And there is no guarantee that all the topological states you classify. I gave you one example yesterday that in 3D you'll have 15 different classes of to topological insulators and many of them have not been realized, even though there are so many materials. So there's no guarantee that topology uh, predicted something, some state of matter that will be there. There's no reason to believe that it will, uh, you'll find that in the materials database, that there's a chemical compound, say gallium nitride or something, or some variation that will realize that state. So the topological classification is independent of its existence in, in the material space. So one approach we are taking in our lab uh, is that how to, uh, uh, how to create novel, how to create novel topological states based on the existing materials. And uh, so our target is to, uh, uh, is to try to create states that you cannot just find in, in, in some particular material. So this is the first, uh, first approach, I, I will say. So this, is, uh, this approach is, uh, is, is based on it, 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 uh, what I mean is that, okay, so whatever is the material out there, it has a band structure electronic band structure, right. And now, now I can classify band structure crossings and, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean all of that in a, in a topological sense. Then I say that, okay, uh, there are, uh, so, so, I mean, let's say if you just take the space group, there are two, uh, 230 space groups, right? And uh, now you could say that, okay, uh, now I, can, I want to classify topological states based on the symmetry, spatial symmetries. So then you get some finite number of states that are possible. What I, the statement I made that there is no guarantee that one part, uh, th there would be a material that correspond to one of the group, one of, uh, what you want, right? So, uh, so I'm saying that this is the future of the field that Right, you can classify and you can list, you can make a, yeah, yeah. Their, their experimental realization may not be out there. Uh, so I'm, I'm saying that then we need to develop some materials approach where, uh, which can be more broadly applied to a targeted family you want to realize. So that's the idea here. And uh, I'll show you one example, so one, uh, one approach is to consider multi-layer topological heterostructures. What do I mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yes. And then they're, they're stacked in the C direction. Yeah, so that, that, the, all those things will depend on what we want to make, and that is, I'll get into that. I'll give you examples. How, what happens if we change thickness? What happens if we change uh, unit cell and things like that? Okay. So, uh, so I, uh, what is interesting? Let's say if you consider uh, a multi-layer uh, heterostructure 
uh, multilayer, which is based uh, where you have a topological insulator layer and then trivial insulator layer, topological insulator layer, and and then you choose some thickness, uh, uh, and then so that's varying, that's setting your TT prime, hopping integrals, right? Now, uh, in such a multilayer, at each interface you have a Dirac fermion, right? That's uh, guaranteed by the topology. So that means your energy landscape, energy uh, versus the prof energy profile here is that unlike a conventional heterostructure, at each interface there will be a Dirac fermion, right? So you can immediately see making such a thing will give you some sort of interesting and new property that's not typically there in gallium arsenide or silicon or other heterostructures, right? And now you can consider, okay, so now I can vary thickness of these layers to uh, get the Dirac fermions hopped from one to the other. And, uh, and, and then we can model such a thing and then see whether such a, uh, whether these systems have some sort of global topological phase transition. If there is a phase transition, then I can enter a new state. So that's the idea. So uh, that's the basic idea. Uh, experimentally, we are utilizing MB, anomalous Sol effect, XMCD, RFS, STM, all these things to study these uh, this systems. So as I already mentioned that uh, there's one particular case where uh, we know that if we uh, put indium into bismuth selenide, our colleagues have figured that out, uh, we're working with Rutgers on that, then uh, the band inversion is inverted. So in other words, you become a trivial insulator. Uh, bismuth selenide becomes trivial insulator if you put certain amount of indium in there. So then, now, why do you want to put a trivial insulator of, of such kind that's because then you can make a, uh, a relatively smooth interface. You cannot just put any insulator and expect the interface to be smooth. So you, you, you are, uh, uh, so that, that way you minimize additional interface physics. Okay, so in the C-axis then you can think, it's kind of like polyacetylene, TT prime model type of thing. Okay, so um, uh, experimentally what we do, we cap these materials with selenium, then we transfer to a spectroscopy chamber, RPS chamber, for example, and then we decap it. How do we know? Uh, why should you believe us that we're not looking at the selenium layer, uh, but we want to look at this layer? So we can do a core level spectroscopy and, and look at the ratio of selenium to bismuth. Uh, say, if you're, look, if you're looking at this layer, then you, there should not be any bismuth. So if you decap, enough, then you can you get recover the right ratio. And also, if indium is on the surface, you'll see that in the spectrum. So, so uh, just to convince you that we have internal diagnostic uh, uh, to figure out what surface we're looking at. Now, it's going back to your question. Yeah. It's actually, um, um, it's, I mean, it, 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 it's actually, it turns out that this films, these thick films grow much better. It's, it's the growth kinetics. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you could also do silicon or some other uh, more standard substrate. Um, uh, it turned out. Yeah, at, at this point, uh, I think it, it, it's also minimizing strain. And this substrate, the part of the physics I'll talk about is less relevant because I'm doing spectroscopy on the top surface. So if you have, if you have something there. Yeah, at this point, we're not taking any special advantage of the substrate. Uh, let's put it that way. It, it, it's not critical for the experiment. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, it depends what, what, you, what we do. Uh, at this point, we're most focusing on spectroscopy. It would be more critical if you're trying to do transport and other things, that low temperature transport that we're not doing for now. So going back to your question, that uh, how thickness changes things, so that also we can experimentally vary. That uh, if we 
if the film, so if it's not selenite film, is seven nanometer, or what we call seven quintuple layer, uh, spectroscopically, really, we can clearly see a Dirac cone and its spin texture. And then uh, now if you make thinner film, six nanometer, four nanometer, three, then you can see that this is broadening up. At some point, there's a gap opening. Now the top and bottom surfaces talk to each other. They're not um, isolated or independent. So that way we know that we are entering a 2D limit. So this is a 3D topological insulator, and on this side, this is 2D film. It may or may not be topological, depends on certain things. But in some cases, it could be a 2D topological insulator. Uh, so, so this is our diagnostic, how we figure out that what is the ideal thickness that maintains the Dirac cone. And if the Dirac cone is destroyed, we know what is the reason for that experimentally. Okay, so now you can see that the spin polarization here is smeared, uh, unlike here, and there's a gap. So this we know that that way, by looking at the top surface, we know that uh, our film is too thin and we're looking at 2D states, not 3D. Okay, so now, uh, what is the goal here? One particular goal is to do this thickness variation and see, first calculate, whether this system globally has a topological phase transition or not. As I showed you, that the uh, key parameters here is just in the first uh, slide on this topic, uh, it's t, t prime over t, th that ratio determines what, what is the topological, whether there is a topological state or not. So uh, one way to understand that, let me, let me go back and, and try to give you intuitive feeling, uh, is that let's say, T double prime is small, or in other words, this blue layer is thick, then what we are in that limit, what we are doing is we just have a stack of isolated topological insulator layer. So then globally, there is no topological states. It just isolated, I, mean, I just stacked some layers, right? But what if this uh, T prime is large so that the Dirac fermions hop? And, and then there is a, a three-dimensional global state. So what is the critical value of T, T prime where that phase transition happens? So that is the idea, that when T prime is large, then uh, you enter a topological state, but if T prime is small, then the bismuth selenide layers are way, way isolated, and, and then you, there's no propagation in the uh, C direction. So you are in a trivial state. Then we have, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'll get to that later, but uh, uh, let's focus on the first one. So then the next thing is how do I translate these Hamiltonian parameters or basic parameters to the materials parameters that I should design, I should fabricate, okay? So we decided that we want to make the top layer four nanometer. Uh, four nanometer, meaning four QL, and we want to vary the blue layer in, in a number of different ways. I can keep it four nanometer or two nanometer with 25% indium or 15% indium or 10% indium and also uh, vary the thickness. So what does it uh, do? Well, now we go back to our experiment. What happens uh, if I have four nanometer, four QL? There is a gap, right? So that means if I do RPS on top of this sample, even though it's a multi-layer, on top of this sample, it will just look like, it should look like this. It should look like there is a gap in the top layer, and there's no Dirac fermion. There's just a gap band structure or uh, massive Dirac fermion. So intuitive, I mean, without thinking much, without the multi-layer effect, you would think that if I do RPS on all these samples, I should see the same thing because RPS is just seeing the uh, surface. Or I can make RPS to see so the surface only. So then you would see that there is no way for us to tell whether there is a topological phase transition or not uh, uh, if I just do RPS. But now imagine this case that when we enter, the, uh, enter this regime, then I have a system that is globally topological now. Let me go back. 
Now, these, uh, these Dirac fermions can hop. Now, I have a three-dimensional uh, state. And this state could be topological. Uh, and if it is topological, then what will happen? Then there will be a boundary state. Without the topological transition, I should see a gap Dirac fermion here, gap Dirac fermion here. But if it is, if it is, if it is becoming topological, it doesn't matter which surface I terminate, it will then show a Dirac cone. So in other words, uh, I expect to see a Dirac cone inside this thing, this 4QL thing. There will be a small Dirac cone if it is topological. That would be my experimental diagnostic. That way I figure out as whether these multi-layers we fabricated, we have crossed the critical point. So this is my experimental diagnostic. Let me, for now, for uh, simplicity, let me now not introduce further parameters, which makes it more rich, but first uh, discuss the experiment, what we see. So if we, so uh, my top layer is 4 nanometer, 4 QL. In all these cases, all I'm varying is the second layer, or the insulating layer, it's now 4 nanometer. Here it's 2 nanometer, but 25% indium. 2 nanometer, but 15% indium. 1 nanometer, now 20% indium. Indium makes it more insulating. And when it is uh, 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 1 nanometer, then it's thin, right? So that means Dirac fermions are hopping. So it created, it, it's likely to create a 3D state, global 3D state. So then you can see that when it's four, and, and this is multi-layer, there are like 30 units of this thing. I, I, I'm not drawing them all. If I do RPS here, you can see that there's a gap. As 4QL should, sh uh, should show, there's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, Dirac states there. But when we go there, we can ex this is just experiment I'm showing. Clearly, there is a, it's, uh, it's gapless. There is a Dirac state in there. So that means even though my top layer is just four qu quintuple layer bismuth selenide, I can now clearly see a multi-layer effect. So in other words, there, is, there, there must be a topological phase transition for me to see that. So this is my experimental diagnostic, how to design and how to fabricate and um, uh, tune these multi-layers so that I can enter various topological states. Now I can make it more complicated by adding, as you were asking, how about T double prime and triple prime, and then I can begin, again calculate the phase diagram and design it that. So first we needed this map between theoretical Hamiltonian and actual material science of fabrication and the experimental detection technology. So that, that's what I, I showed so far. So in other words, I ca I sh what I showed that there is, a, as you go, uh, uh, there is a topological phase transition happening here, somewhere around here between uh, B and C, panel B and C. Uh, um, so so this, this Dirac fermion is the multilayer effect. Okay? So uh, we can also try to understand this thing in terms of the boundary mode or the edge state type of thing. So one can see that when T prime is large, meaning that the, that the uh, topological layers are closely coupled, then that means, uh, that means we have uh, these pairs are together, uh, closely together. And when we have T prime small, the, the, uh, the topological layers are well separated, then we see just uh, this, uh, this end of it. So we can simulate this type of um, profile, energy profile, or band structure profile. And then we can also calculate this into the, uh, by using the model Hamiltonian. And we can also calculate the spectral function that we measure in experiments. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, uh, well, I mean, at this point, we're just doing the T, T prime. And then we are calculating the first order green function, calculating this spectral function the, uh, that we measure in RPS. Yeah, when T double prime is large, then you can calculate. Uh, well, I mean, what I mean is not just the model calculation. I mean the not just the model itself. I mean with the experimental materials parameters. Not. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is like SSH. This is a very basic thing. Yeah, yeah, it's well known. Uh, this, 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 this Hamiltonian is, is, it was described in 1979 by, uh, in the context of poly, polyacetylene. Yeah, the, the, it's the polyacetylene Hamiltonian de described by Sue Schrieffer Higer. I would say this is even before Quantum Hall. This is 1979. And that's how the soliton physics became popular in Dennis Matter. This is pre-quantum hall. So we are going way back in time. But it, it turns out these polyacetylenes are very difficult to do spectroscopy with. So you might say that, okay, I'm, 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 I'm fabricating an advanced version of, tunable version of polyacetylene. But then in actual polyacetylene, you could not do those tuning. Here I can uh, tune all these parameters. And it's a designer Hamiltonian approach, yes. Okay? Uh, and then, as I said, that then you can also consider uh, this additional term and solve the model and, and fabricate and then show that you have it. Okay? Yeah, yeah. On the, on the boundary, I'm saying that if, I mean, SSH model, depending on the, pa I mean, if you take the model, say TT prime model, you do a phase diagram of the model, and that model has a part of the phase diagram is topological, and then our other part is not. I'm saying that we can simulate, we can experimentally design both, which is not possible in polyacetylene. Polyacetylene by itself, it has soliton, and then you cannot do anything. You can study that phase transition or topological transition. But that's, that's the basic unit. I, I'm going to stuff things that are more fun. I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, 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 figuring out uh, the basics. So now, OK, you see that, OK, so I didn't find any new physics. I, I guess that's what was the question, that, that model Hamiltonian is understood and solved. What is the new physics you find? The new physics, what we are after, so this is what I promise, that I'll show some development and then I'll show how experiment is going into new directions. So one possibility is that you can take these multi-layers. Uh, in one case, I, the, f the first case I show TI, non-TI, TI, non-TI, non but I can also do TI, magnetic TI, TI, magnetic TI. So this would be a way to create a tunable vile semi-metal. The vile semi-metal I showed yesterday those are just out there. This uh, tantalum arsenide, it's out there. We measure it, and uh, you, you saw how complicated the uh, spectra was. We, we, there, there's no clean um, uh, pair of vial nodes. I mean, there are 24 uh, vial nodes in there. So here, you can systematically create your, uh, your vial, vial semi-metal by doing that. Of course, now, making these things takes time. It's, it's, a, it's not a quick and dirty thing. I mean, it takes a long time to do MBE and perfect each magnetic layer with certain magnetic orientation and all of that. So that's one direction we're pursuing. Another direction we're pursuing, we can now, you know, there's a lot of interest in topological superconductors and, and a major challenge or problem in that field is that how do you know that the whatever superconductor you looked at is topological? Or uh, maybe it's close to topological, maybe it's not, we don't know, but we cannot tune that topolo superconductor. But here, you can now replace the magnetic layer with superconducting layers. And we know that strontium dope bismuth selenide superconducts, copper dope bismuth selenide super. They don't, by themselves, they do not have to be. There's debate whether they're by themselves topological or not, but even if they're not, I can use this multi-layer approach and find a topological phase transition that is guaranteed to be a 3D topological superconductor, right? So this is, these are the future directions in my lab, and these things take time, like, as you see. It's not just growing a heterostructure, it's, it's a multi-layer that, that will take. So, but this is a designer Hamiltonian approach. This is what also I mentioned that some topological phase may be in the classification are predicted, but it, uh, it may not exist out there. You have to make one. So this is the approach. Now, on the superconducting side, the base thing, the, uh, you can also get these things by perfecting a, 
uh, uh, a single heterostructure with topological insulator and superconductor. This is the original Fu Kane proposal, the slide I borrowed from Charlie Kane. And uh, the idea here is simple. Um, uh, is that uh, on the topological insulator surface, you have half Dirac gas, as I showed yesterday. Uh, you have half the degrees of missing. You have uh, uh, spin helical locking, spin momentum locking. So now you are dealing with, now when you introduce Cooper pairing, you're dealing with superconductivity in a half Dirac gas. This is different from superconductivity in a conventional 2D electron system. So now we have half the degrees of freedom missing. Then you can calculate uh, for, so this superconductor is a half of an ordinary superconductor and whose vortex has a highly non-trivial ground state. That's the Fouquet result that uh, half of an ordinary superconductor uh, will have, huh? No, this is P plus IP, P plus minus IP, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the, the this S wave is the, S wave you bring in, right? Uh, at the interface, you create a P wave, right? So, so the the in, uh, the uh, the proximity effect on the Dirac surface states creates that P wave. But the superconductor you be bring in is S wave. Yeah. So that's the uh, interesting thing about it. So now we can see that to realize, to know uh, experimentally that whether we have a topological superconductor or not. What do we have to do? You can already see from this slide that we have to see at the interface, is there a Dirac cone like this that I already showed yesterday, right? Uh, there's Dirac cone speed momentum locking. What I did not show is that, uh, what I did not show is if you attach a superconductor and cool below the tr transition temperature, whether there is Cooper pairing on the Dirac helical states, okay? But spectroscopically, we can do that. There is no problem. And that is our diagnostic that you are approaching a topological superconductor. It's very difficult to achieve these things with transport. You can do all sorts of transport where you know what is happening at the interface, what, because when you have a superconductor, be it at the interface or the bulk, all the Fermi surfaces will superconduct. All the states will superconduct. So, uh, so our approach, this work is in collaboration with Nitin Shamart, uh, is to uh, study this bismuth selenide films on top of niobium selenide, uh, where you have uh, SOF superconductivity. We want to see what happens at the interface and also on the top surface, because uh, this, this, this is, uh, uh, if it is thin enough, then uh, you'll see the stuff in there. Uh, again, we uh, cap, decap, and then we have diagnostic. We know which surface you're looking at. Again, uh, this is how we figure out whether in the 2D limit or 3D limit by sp doing spectroscopic checks. Okay? So then, uh, as I showed yesterday, if you are just looking at the topological insulator on the surface, you will see a Dirac cone. You're, you have a circular Fermi surface. If you do spin measurement, you'll see spin momentum locking, this helical locking. So what is new in this experiment is that now what we want to do, if we cool the sample heterostructure below the transition temperature, we want to see whether the Dirac cone is superconducting. In other words, is there a Cooper pairing going on in the Dirac helical state? So ARPES is again a fantastic thing for that because we can image the K space location so this is, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, Tc is 7 Kelvin, around 7 Kelvin. Now you can say when you're at 12 Kelvin, the normal state at very low energies near a millivolt, you have a Fermi step. There's nothing. And that this, is, this Fermi state is coming from uh, the uh, Dirac state. And then you, uh, as you lower temperature, things get red and red. Uh, look at the one Kelvin, clearly there is a gap. Is the, the firm, using the Fermi step, you line up the Fermi level, and then you can see a gap has developed, and there's a coherence peak, right? And this gap 
you can measure by looking at the RPS data, you see that the gap is about 0.5 millivolts, right? And this 0.5 millivolt uh, is, uh, then you can, based on the gap size, you can also estimate the TC, which gives you something around 7 Kelvin. So in other words, there's internal consistency. No, we we, uh, we we don't we don't immediately know what is creating the pairing, but what we can guarantee that because we can image that in the normal state before TC there's a Dirac uh, circle, but when you pull below TC the Dirac circle is gone. There is a gap. Now at one Kelvin there is everything is gap. You can see. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, 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 right, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm saying that experimentally I don't know what leads to pairing, but I can tell what I'm confirming there is pairing. There, there's, a, there's a gap and then there's a coherence peak, right? Now I can, uh, I can also, yeah, yeah, it's in the particle hole. Um, well, we can we can try to analyze it further and see uh, what is uh, fit into some BCS function, and um, uh, we we haven't done that in great detail, but we could do that. Uh, I'll show some some fitting of gap uh, in a moment. So now you can see, but not only that, uh, we do that. We can do that. We can also do that in momentum resolve way. So we should be able to tell if the uh, gap is isotropic or anisotropic. It's something you don't immediately do that with transport. So we, and we can tell you exactly how anisotropic the gap is. Isotropic. So within the resolution of the experiment, we see it's fully gap. There's no node. So not, it's, not, it's not like high TC D wave where there is a node. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 it, it could be. Uh, let's say if you if you realize p plus minus i p, and if you have gap measurement in some space, then that will also be fully gapped, right? P plus i p will give you p x squared, p y squared. So when we measure the gap, you will not be able to. See, you cannot tell by gap measurement and isotropy measurement that it's P wave or S wave by itself, okay? Huh? I, it's not direct phase sensitive. Yeah, I mean, you have to do other things, but I'm saying that, so this is telling us that there is gap and there's no node, and within resolution, our resolution, it's more or less, uh, it's, I mean, this is just uh, noise. I mean, the, it's within the error bar. It's kind of like isotropic, okay? Nearly isotropic. Uh, but what is curing is that we have um, uh, the the gap disappeared of our TC. So this uh, so so it's not some extrinsic gap we are seeing. We are seeing the gap that is related to the superconductor in that there. Because by lo just looking at the spectroscopic data, this gap doesn't mean it's superconducting gap, right? Could be some extrinsic uh, thing. Okay. Now, it goes back to your question that can we try to fit the coherence peak and get more information? And that is what we're trying to do here. That now, before th uh, doing that, uh, I'll also tell you what is the challenge. Now, you can see that your Fermi level is in the conduction band. It's not in the, uh, not in the, uh, in the, in the uh, surface states alone. So when you are measuring, you have to select k values where you measure, but it also gives us one advantage. Advantage is that we know that the surface state merges with the bulk at the edge of the band, and so then this is surface 
sensitive and this is more bulk like. So now when we cool down, this is above TC, you cool down, everything is superconducting. All bands open a superconducting gap, right? But we can also image that, how much gap is open in the bulk, how much gap is open in the surface. So now what we can do is uh, look at the sp spectral function in the bulk in the band and also in the surface band. So this is on the surface band uh, uh, and this is on the bulk band. Uh, the color coding is not quite right. Uh, so this black means correspond to this uh, blue things and uh, green corresponds to that. Okay, so here, it's the bulk is black, surface is blue. We can see that if we try to fit with a BCS wave function, it has less, uh, little less agreement. Uh, and then if you are looking at on the surface, probably a little better agreement. But based on that, I would not conclude that I'm seeing some P plus IP. I mean, this is to answer your question that by fitting how much we learn. I mean, it looks like it's a little better, but then who knows? Okay, but so what is then our claim that it's topological superconductivity? The claim goes back to here. It's a very simple proposal. Fukin is a very simple proposal. All you have to make sure on the surface or interface, you just have a Dirac cone, and it's superconducting. That guarantees since we can with our we can count all the degrees of freedom. We can do spin and momentum and energy. We have to make sure that we have half the degrees of freedom. In other words, wh whether the system has half of an ordinary superconductor. That is already fixed by this, because there's no other Fermi surface there. This is a half Dirac gas. And since these, this gap opens uh, only on this sub Fermi surface, so it's a half of an ordinary superconductor. Even though we are not giving you a direct, decisive proof of P wave superconductivity, but by construction and exhaustive uh, degree of freedom mapping, we, uh, we, we don't have any other way out, uh, of interpreting this thing. So that's, that's our claim. But of course, uh, one has to do other type of faint sensitive experiments to prove that this is uh, P. Uh, but, this is, but this approach is by construction. We're designing the system to be like that. So. Um, what else can we do? I mean, of, of course, the obvious thing, and then look at the vortex, and some people have done that. Uh, people in uh, gr some groups in China, uh, they have done that. They look at the uh, vortex in these compounds, in this heterostructure, and they see zero bias peak, and then they claim that Maurana. But then again, you can also ask uh, zero bias peak good enough to, to based on that, your claim for Maurana is good enough or you need to show that they are uh, braiding statistics, they have non-abelian statistics, so it, it depends how much uh, detail of evidence you want. We did not look on this compound. Uh, the, uh, the other, gr other groups have looked at it. I, I, I'm not going into that. I'm going into a different direction. Okay, I have a program in my lab, we're doing that, but a, chi uh, uh, a Chinese group has already done that. They have a claim that they, in this sample, this heterostructure, they see a zero bar speak, and they claim that Maharana, okay? So I, I, uh, I, I, I'll not go to get into that direction now. It's a like 2D interface, superconductor, vortex uh, core has a zero bar speak. So that's all they show, okay? So uh, what I'm now getting into is without the Maharana debate or anything, I'm trying to uh, get what other new things you can do? Uh, I mean, of course, doing non-Abelian physics is interesting and quantum computing, all that. But there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there are other interesting things to do with topological superconductors the way we grow them. So one theoretical proposal is that if you take a topological superconductor and magnetically dope the system near the critical point, this critical point is between a superconductor and a Dirac metal. And uh, this critical point has very interesting properties. Some people claim that this critical point has uh, some sort of emergent supersymmetry. Uh, uh, so, so this is one of the things we are interested in. Uh, can we make a critical topological 
Dirac superconductors. So using the algorithm, materials algorithm I showed, uh, in addition to what I was doing, we can also do surface gating, chemical gating on the surface by doped uh, doped molecules on the surface. Now you can see that there, uh, without any surface doping, uh, your Fermi level is up here, but you want to be at the Dirac nodal point. Uh, but with chemical doping, we showed that we developed an algorithm that you can actually place your chemical potential there. So this is where we stand at this point. So in other words, this state is a quantum critical topological superconductor, if you like, um, by construction. Okay. Uh, and then with point contact transport, we, we see a number of reflections, but it's it's too early to claim anything out of it. But this is a frontier direction, so I'll leave it like that, okay? So, so, um, so understanding this topological superconductor quantum criticality is, is, is a future direction for the field where I think, uh, again, there is opportunity for theorists. There are open questions in theory, opportunity for theorists to contribute. Okay, my next challenge, is there any question on the last topic? before I move. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we, we, right, there's a very good question. We tried that early on. So what we tried to do, we took a high TC compound, say cuprate D-wave, and uh, put bismuth selenide, topological insulator on top, and tried to see whether the D-wave pairing is induced on this Dirac surface state. And that experiment, as I, uh, I, prov I was telling colleagues at the lunch, that a lot of failed experiments that you don't hear because uh, there's no result. So it turns out that all these cuprates, you know, their Fermi surfaces are like this. Whereas the bismuth selenide Fermi surface is here at the uh, gamma point, you have a Dirac thing. There's not much uh, overlap. So when you, when you do that, I mean, you, have, you need a momentum transfer for the pairing. So in other words, even though the TC is high, the induced uh, TC is way too low, the, or uh, the, the proximity effect is way too small that uh, drops it probably below 4 Kelvin or something, then we don't see it. So we have a paper in PRB where we documented that if you take a BISCO sample uh, and put a topological insulator on top, you don't really see that. Yeah, 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 definitely. So then our next try was uh, on MGB2. Uh, it's not necessarily as correlated as cuprates, but MGB2 at least has higher TC, 40 to 50, right? We wanted to see if we can see topological superconductivity at 40 Kelvin, which is like 7 Kelvin. And then MGB2 crystals cannot be grown too big for that interface to work. And also it's a cubic crystal, whereas TIs are hexagonal layered, so then the match is not good. So there is ongoing effort, but these are all great ideas. And some of these we tried already, and we're not showing because we, uh, we did not succeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they, 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 their claim is based on STM. They see a, as they probe the, when they're away from the vortex core, they don't see anything. And when uh, they, they take the STM tube tip at the vortex core, they see a signal. Vortices, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, those, I mean, interpretation of zero bias peak in vortex core is very complicated. There are other possibilities and all that. I, I, I mean, it's important experiment, but I would not see it to say it's decisive proof of that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's my next topic. It's, it's good. So your question brings me to my next topic. And what you are trying to say, that's my theory paper, where we claim that instead of what Chinese group is, uh, is doing, uh, which is good, uh, but 
you could also avoid the vortex physics. So this is our theory paper where we claim that the chiral Majorana, you could do that on a superconducting topological insulators, but you need a churn gap magnet. So this is my next talk, right? So uh, to see create this chiral Majorana, you need a uh, topological magnet, and then you you do the proximity there. Okay. So yesterday I I I, I in the colloquium I I, I I gave you some idea. What is the spectroscopic signature of a churn gap magnet? Your uh, transport signature is you'll see quantum anomalous Hall effect, right? Uh, it's like uh, seeing uh, uh, quantized Hall conductivity without an external magnetic field. But what is its spectroscopic signature? Because that's what that's how we are identifying things. Uh, uh, it's important to find the spectroscopic signature. That way, you can develop a lot of materials and related technology. So as I said, that one thing we do, we can dope in the bulk or on the surface, and then we can look at the dichroic signal and uh, look at the magnetization. And if there is a hysteresis in the uh, magnetization signal, and this, if this hysteresis is uh, correlated with the observation of a spectral weight suppression or gap, then we believe that we are seeing a magnetic topological insulator. Okay. So of course, the idea of the gap is that the the crossing was protected by time reversal, since magnetic impurity is break time reversal. So the Dirac uh, Dirac crossing is destroyed, and you open it up. Okay. But then the experimental diagnostic is that uh, I'll sh as, uh, I'll show you in a moment. There can be gaps for other crazy reasons. Uh, and so that's why this coupling is very important that we had to do in situ measurement of hysteresis and, and couple it to that. And then, of course, you can also do this thing like uh, how magnetization, whether there's a temperature dependence, right? If, if it is related to magnetization, when uh, magnetization disappears, the gap should also disappear, and it's an interaction effect. So. One uh, powerful diagnostic is that, uh, you know, if you look at this image, it's not immediately clear. I mean, the, the, the no spectral weight means green, but in the middle, the, it's, it's kind of still whitish. So it's not immediately clear. It's a clear gap, clean gap or not. Or am I playing with the image color plot or something? Uh, who knows? So. Uh, so, in order to convince ourselves and convince yourself, yeah. Uh, in, in this case, we are putting impurities. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we can do that. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we, 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 we are not going in that direction, but uh, first we will we'll show that how to prove that this is a magnetized topological insulator, which is a topological object, meaning that it has a churn number. That's what uh, we're trying to do. And uh, also, it's kind of like two, quasi 2D. It's not a 3D, all of that. But all the, I mean, DM and all these things, in a more complex manner, all those things will come into picture. And I believe by extending our te technique or uh, collection of techniques, you could isolate all those terms. Okay, so what we claimed or what we found is that the best way to see whether time reversal symmetry is broken or not, just look at the spin texture of the surface state. So even though where existence of gap or clean gap may not be clear, but if the if it is due to broken time reversal, then your spin texture will also be broken time. Uh, it will, will reflect that. It will, it will not obey time reversal. In the Dirac cone case, uh, I showed yesterday, or it's also here, that this spin texture is time reversal invariant. Uh, K plus, K minus, there is always a, a, a relationship between the two. Uh, now, but here, you see that the spin texture the measured spin texture is based on this data. We, we're drawing these arrows and this kind of like 3D thing. 
is like this. Now, if you, let's say your Fermi level is here, then you have a net polarization, spin polarization on the surface, right? So clearly it's not time reversal uh, uh, symmetric, it's broken. So this is our diagnostic that instead of clearly identifying a gap, if we find that the surface state spin texture uh, breaks time reversal, there is some sort of magnetism must be there. And, and that magnetism should have some global component. Otherwise, how do you explain that in a uh, K-resolved spectroscopy? Because we're seeing that in momentum space. If you say that it's uh, totally disordered or inhomogeneous at a level, then in K-space you, you see broad stuff. You should not. But the fact that we can resolve these things in K space, that uh, tells us that there is uh, uh, some degree of uh, homogeneous magnetization in the system. Okay, and then uh, we can also see how the uh, how it disappears as you raise temperature, and uh, non-magnetic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. Good. I. I <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's fine. I, I can quickly wrap up. So, so the, the diagnostic is that um, the spin texture, and then we can do a very phase tunability. So now this, so that means now we have a churn magnet. Now it goes back to your question. Now, if you place that on top of a superconductor, you will create a chiral Maurana. Now you don't need uh, you don't need vortex, and you could not only, in principle, do transport and spectroscopy. It's much less complicated, and its interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, it, it by itself is, is topological in a different way. Yeah. So then let me skip the uh, vial part and go to the just summarize the part I did not show yesterday, is that. Uh, there are proposals of tilted vial that we also realized. This is our paper. Uh, now you see, so when you have a vial cone like this, that's Lorentz invariant in QFT sense, right? But your band structure doesn't have to obey Lorentz invariants necessarily. So you could have a tilted band structure like this, but then all the topological properties are still applicable. So now you can see that your vial cone is tilted. So it's kind of like uh, light cone, I mean, this analogy, it take it with a grain of salt, it's like your light cone approaching black hole. So then you'll get a tilt, right? So that it's, uh, it's Lorentz violation in the sense so you're approaching quantum gravity in some sense. So, so but, it, but an, that analogy in some way, it's also not too crazy because now uh, from a transport property point of view, this material, if you do transport in QFT, your um, uh, Adler, Bell, Jackie, chiral anomaly is isotropic. It doesn't depend on which direction you apply E and B field, right? That's a standard model QFT. But in these materials, your chiral anomaly would be direction dependent. In certain directions, there is no anomaly. There's a normal Fermi surface. In other directions, there is a chiral anomaly. So, so you could realize uh, a different metric for a different universe out of this. Uh, this material. So, I mean, th this is fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah approaching black holes, yeah. So, uh, uh, I'm uh, again, uh, I'll skip the magnet and almost, yeah. Yeah. Right. Sure. I mean, this is my last slide. So, one, uh, only one thing I want to say that by introducing superconductivity in vial physics, you'll open up vial marana related thing. There's a tremendous uh, excitement, both from theory and experiment. Uh, theory is also um, as open frontier on that. Thank you. That, that, that's all. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's okay. <laughs>